Yeah, okay, so I'll say at least. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'd like to get started if you have a chance to grab a seat. I want to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelco. I direct the Environmental Change and Security Program. It's a real pleasure to welcome you all today to what I think is the fifth series, uh, fifth meeting in a series on fisheries. Get it confused, we're getting up there in numbers, whether it's the fourth or the fifth or sixth. But we've been spending some time on this issue and we appreciate seeing a lot of familiar faces back in the room um, for today's discussion, which we've entitled Confronting Fishing Overcapacity and Other Long Overdue Reforms. So we can debate um, those long overdue reforms and have uh, really an excellent panel to um, give us their take on these issues and then have a discussion with this group of, of NGO and government and scholarly uh, folks. Those of you who uh, allow me a word about the Wilson Center, for those of you who may be here for the first time, uh, the Wilson Center is actually the formal memorial to Woodrow Wilson. So we were created by Congress in 1968 as a nonpartisan, non-advocacy institution to bring the worlds of scholarship and policy together. Wilson happened to be our only president with a PhD, and so Congress thought it was appropriate that the, the uh, institution honoring him reflected that legacy. The Environmental Change and Security Program is a 13-year-old program, uh, and we, in that same vein, try to facilitate this dialogue among um, practitioners and scholars uh, in the areas of environment, health, population, development, and foreign policy and security policy. And so uh, today's discussion fits squarely within our, our mandate, which actually gives us a lot of latitude, so it's terrific. Um, I should say this series on um, fisheries issues is one that has been um, uh, really a collaboration uh, with USAID. It's, um, it's a series that they're supporting financially, but really has been one where we've worked very closely um, with folks there. So it's terrific that Barbara Best is here. Uh, Richard Volk, unfortunately, is on travel, but hopefully he'll be able to watch the video and catch up. The video, we are uh, webcasting this session live, and so when it comes to Q&A, uh, I ask that you wait for a colleague of mine to bring you a microphone and, and tell us who you are and uh, pose your question to the mic so folks online, um, both live and then the archive video, will be able to hear it. So let me turn to the speakers quickly uh, and get on with the, get on with the discussion. Um, you will have uh, been able to pick up up front uh, larger bio sketches of each of our three folks, so I'll keep it short. Um, we're going to be uh, first have uh, Jim Cher Cherico uh, uh, speaking. He's currently a, f a senior fellow with Resources for the Future, a natural resource economist, primarily focusing on economic analysis of marine issues. Currently serving on a National Academy of Sciences committee, the uh, CA Marine Life Protection Act committee. Uh, so it's terrific that Jim will kick us off. Then Annie Jarrett, uh, coming from Australia. It's terrific that um, she's in North America and we can. Uh, grab her for an afternoon because uh, she's obviously coming from a very long way away. Involved in catching, marketing, and management sectors of Australian commercial fishing industry for over 25 years. So uh, a tremendous amount of experience from very different perspectives um, Annie has. She's an ex-officio member of the Marine Stewardship Council's board and the commercial sector co-chair of the MSC Stakeholder Council. Uh, she's an executive officer of the Northern Prawn Fishery Management Advisory Committee member of the Australian Commonwealth Fisheries Association and the Queensland Fisheries Tribunal. So she's um, sitting in a lot of interesting places and so it'll be terrific to hear her perspective on these issues as well today. And then as a discussant to um, throw out some provocative points and get our discussion going, we have Tundi Agardi, who's the founder and executive director of Sound Seas, uh, a group that promotes effective marine conservation by really bringing together the worlds of science and policy, much of what we're trying to do here today. Uh, she is formerly with WWF as a senior scientist and Conservation International as senior director of the Global Marine Program. And I will also say um, someone who brought, taking advantage of kids to, kids to work day. So we're, 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 it's terrific to have, um, have her doing that. I wish I was doing the same thing. You've, you've inspired me. Next year I'll do it the same myself. Um, so Jim, why don't we turn the floor over to you. Sure. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can get out of this. I want to thank USAID and the center. It's an honor to be uh, part of such a privileged and uh, highly respected seminar series. And I also want to uh, say up front, I want to thank Jim Weiland of the University of California Davis, a very good friend and colleague who shared some slides with me, especially some of the fun ones uh, are from him. 
So what my role here today is to sort of give you an economic perspective about at the 35,000 foot level on overcapacity in fisheries. Um, as you heard, I'm a senior fellow at Resources for the Future. For those of you who don't know uh, RFF, we're an independent nonprofit think tank here in town. It's been around uh, almost 55 years. Um, at RFF, I am known as the fish guy. Most of our work is in climate. Uh, we have a couple people working on these issues. All right. Let's see. So just to give you a quick overview, um, I was asked to you know to sort of set the stage, and so I'm going to do that by talking about the sort of evolution of fishery management in institutions, and it's important in doing so because it sets the stage for understanding overcapacity. And um, I'll also talk about. As an economist, we view overcapacity as a symptom of a, uh, more fundamental underlying causes. And then I'll talk about policies that can address overcapacity and overfishing and then end with some discussion points. OK, so how did we get here? And that's not the Woodrow Wilson Center. This is you know, the phrase we always hear, too many boats chasing too many fish. Well, first of all, in my view, that's way too simplistic. What it is is too many boats chasing too few fish, too much fishing power, too little wealth, too few large predators, too much habitat damage, too much pollution, and now you know why they didn't ask me to design catchy phrases. <laughs> but that's really where we are, right? So that's what I mean. How did we get to this uh, situation? And to do that, I think you only really have to go back to sort of post-World War II to get a good understanding of where we are. So. To set the stage, you think post-World War II, we had a lot of advances in naval technologies, right, through the war, marine, uh, naval operations, <coughs> and that then began to transfer over into fishing, commercial shipping, etc. There was a shipbuilding boom going on. There was, this was the beginning of the expansion, really, of high seas fishing fleets, and you also have to remember that during the war, there was sort of a de facto moratorium in the high seas. And so this was all occurring with relatively healthy fish stocks. And so it became extremely profitable operations, which is important because that created more incentives to continue the expansion. So going into the 1950s, this expansion continues. But now we're beginning to see some signs of overfishing. And it's not coincidentally from an academic perspective that in the 1950s is when we begin to see the works of Beverton and Hull, seminal work on fishery management issues, the defining of the concepts of maximum sustainable yield. You had some work done by economists beginning to address how do we think about overfishing, and that is in response to this, the beginnings of it occurring out in the oceans. Well, we get to the 1960s in the U.S., our fisheries are a mess. There's very few controls globally on domestic fleets that are operating within the territorial seas, which are out to 12 miles. And then what you also had going on is you had sort of domestic fleets, but then these large foreign fleets that are operating right outside of 12 miles. So this is the beginning you get to see of the sort of tragedy to commons operating, right? There was very few controls domestically, and there's very few incentives to control domestic fisheries because the idea that, well, why should I restrict domestic fleets if they're going to you know, catch less fish while well, those fish are just going to swim out beyond 12 miles and get caught by the foreign fleet? And so it was the beginnings of sort of this race down to the bottom. We get to the 1970s, global marine harvest quadrupled. There was an increasing demand for seafood, greater catches, beginning to lead to conflicts between the domestic and foreign fleets. And this is examples of the cod wars between Iceland and Great Britain, just to sort of illustrate. So you know, how did we get to the, uh, this quadrupling? What kind of process was it? Well, this growth came about largely through very chaotic and unplanned increases in fishing capacity rather than any sort of careful ma management. Right? It was in response to conditions that were there. It was profitable to do it. There was domestic uh, reasons to sort of increase. Well, what happened then in the 1970s, 80s, throughout this sort of 10-year block, you had the expansion of the territorial waters to 200 miles. For uh, historians of fishery management, globally, this is an incredibly important step. Right? You took waters that were only at nations, coastal nations waters that were out to 12. You expanded it out to 200 miles. So you essentially gave uh, the coastal nations control over most of the world's fishery stocks. Because remember, most of them are, occur on the upwellings and the continental shelf, which are covered typically in many places out 
200 miles, not necessarily 12 miles. So you had this effect of converting this global commons into a system that gave the coastal nations the ability to manage fisheries. So you know, what are sort of the impacts of this jurisdiction extension? Well, you had a shuffling of the world production and trade. So you know, had uh, nations that weren't coastal nations but had invested in high seas fishing fleets were now being shut out of many fisheries. You had changes in who had the rights to fish, domestic countries, coastal nations. Then that shifted the whole trade balance. Right, going on about who was trading with whom the fish. So it was a large shift in total production and who was doing the production. And then if you look at this, you ask questions like, well, you know, what are the different approaches that these coastal nations did once they were given the 200, or actually not necessarily given, they took the, out to 200 miles. And the, rec the record is quite mixed. On one hand, the idea of restricting access is a sort of precondition for addressing many of the issues associated with common property open access. So you had this idea that you, know, you really could begin to rationalize, to deal with overcapacity, overfishing. Well, what, re what happened essentially was that many of the countries just sort of simply replaced the foreign fleet with domestic capacity. So there was growth in the domestic, and that was mainly fueled through vessel construction subsidies loans. So it was the idea in, in the 70s starting in the 60s of this idea of expansion of the domestic fleets to kind of replace the, the foreign fleet capacity. And the result was a continued growth in harvesting power and large scales to handling and processing, you know, the large catcher vessel, uh, vessel processor boats. Of course, not all fish stocks were privatized because fish don't always stay within political boundaries. They make, you know, make things difficult for us, especially out in the high seas. So there's issues there. You also found that in a lot of the less developed countries, they didn't have the resources necessary to manage or monitor and enforce um, once they got the, the rights out to 200 miles. And in some places, you had corruption occurring where leaders were actually you know, selling out to foreign fleets or essentially came into the domestic waters and mined out the resources. Um, there was no uh, issue of trying to do this in some sort of sustainable manner. So, this is all a very long-winded introduction, but what's sort of the legacy of this sort of extension? On the biological side, it really depends on who you ask, because it's sort of a glass half full, half empty sort of story. On one side, you could look at it half full and say that two-thirds of the stocks, this is like summarizing FAO data, are fully or underexploited. And some might argue that we essentially want all stocks up at the fully exploited level. And so, you know, we've got room to expand, so things aren't as bad. On the other hand, you often hear about how things are fully or overexploited. So it's taking the same statistics, just, just you know, conveying them in a different manner, and that's sort of the glass half empty. What I'm going to focus on is I'm not going to get into which view is right, but I'm going to then compare this on the economic side and say that even the most charitable opinions about how we're doing in terms of economics conclude that the world's fisheries are providing very little, if any, economic return. So it's not even a question half glass, uh, what's half full or half empty. There's no glass. <laughs> so just to give you a quick uh, profit loss statement, these numbers are old, but they give you some idea. You've got revenues on the order of about 100 billion, costs on the under, uh, order of 132 billion. If you look at the breakdown of costs, you see this large cost going into maintenance of vessels, and that's part of you know, how we manage. We'll get to why we, we might be seeing that. So you've got a net loss here of about $32 billion. But you know what? It's even worse than that. Because as you I'll talk about, there's no contribution here to wealth. And we should expect that fisheries are providing returns over and above their operating costs. So we're now you know, $32 billion below, or this is actually is old data, below the revenues. We actually should be significantly positive, not just at zero. Okay, And I'll explain that economists call this idea economic rents, but I have a farming example which will illustrate that a little bit better. So what I want to do now is to think about how we characterize the fishery policy problem because to un that's essential to sort of to discuss in my view how you address <laughs> overcapacity issues, whether it be in uh, first world, second world, third world countries. So I'm going to do this with this idea of a cause problem solution framework. Um, and some of these are from Jim Weil and these graphs. So, okay, so on the problem side, what do you typically hear? You hear about overfishing, overcapacity, habitat destruction, bycatch, fishing down the food, food chain, right? Those are the sort of popular things you would hear out 
And what do then do they attribute the causes of this to? Well, often you'll hear things like it's due to greed, the short-sightedness, which these are all synonymous, or this idea of prospects of wealth. The industry is out to catch as many fish as they can. They don't worry about the future at all, right? And so you could call that greed. You could call it short-sightedness. But that's the, the cause here that we have to deal with. And then what are the solutions that will then come from this? Or you get ideas of tighter controls on fishing effort, right? The idea we need to restrict where they fish, how much they fish, the vessel sizes, the mesh size. You get questions of, well, we need to think about ecosystem-based fisheries management, precautionary principle. You could think about implementing networks of reserves. Okay, and this is all these solutions are meant to deal with the problems. Of course, some of them are better than others. And just to get this going in terms of discussion later on, pulling out some quotes that you often hear. So, the short sightedness and greed of humans underlie the difficulties in management of resources. These are natural resources. Wealth or prospect of wealth generates political and social power that is used to promote unlimited exploitation of resources. And then the conclusion is management authorities must design, justify, and administer a collection of restraints on fishing activity. Okay, these are typically the things that you would hear. Um, so what I want to do is sort of flip this and say, okay, how does an economist come to this problem? I'm not speaking for all of them, but in general, this is what we would address it. We start with problems. We would see the same thing, but we would see it as coming out of the race to fish. So we have overcapitalization, we have excessive bycatch, discards also, habitat destruction, political manipulation, mixed use conflicts, uh, perverse innovation in terms of the gear capacity. But what's the fundamental cause? We wouldn't necessarily start with this idea of short-sightedness or greed, but instead go back to why we see the tragedy of the commons, this idea that there's insecure property rights or lack, the <coughs> access rights are not very well defined. So with this framework cause problem, we address the solutions, we come to fix the property rights problem. So it's not necessarily additional gear restrictions on a thing, is address property rights. And when you do that, there's sets of tools that I'll talk about. There's the ITQs, individual transferable quotas, which is an old name. IFQs, which is old. I think they're, what, Rebecca, they're limited access privileges. And, and DAPs. And DAPs, and dedicated access privileges now. Um, and there's other things I also want to talk about, cooperatives, territorial use rights, and fisheries, also known as TERFs, <coughs> are also other means by which you can address. So getting the story right, we, I would argue, is very important. You know, is it greed? Is it insecure property rights? Is it more top-down, different governance? Is it, do we believe that the behavior of the industries, whether it be small or large scale, are rigid? That is, they're going to do what we see? Or is there... Can we change their behavior by altering incentives? Your view on this d will determine how you address overcapacity. Of course, the economist is all on the uh, right-hand side for you, on the other side of the or statement. Okay, so to sort of illustrate this, this is Jim's slides. I, I think these are great, so I wanted to use them. Is you know thinking about farming and drawing analogies. So you know evolution of farming as we know it started out. You're pulling the back goes on with animals, and then all of a sudden the evolution to tractors, right? It all made sense. There was property rights there. You were able to reap the rewards um, and gain the benefits of your better stewardship. So what did you see in farming? Well, you saw innovation through, you know, the ideas of introducing tractors, et cetera, competition, organization. It's led to profits in the farming sector. That's led to something called rents. And so here's a good way to describe rents. So an economist, when you think about uh, agriculture, the farmer, let's say that one who owns the land, right? They can farm the land themselves. And so in that case, they'll get some, they'll have some operating costs of doing it, and they'll get some profits from farming it. But what they should earn is not just profits equal operating costs, but enough to offset what they could have gotten if they went and rented the land out. Right? Think of it another way. Think of it if you're a sharecropper or a tenant farmer. When you went to you know, rent that piece of parcel a hectare, you'd want to make sure that you not just re reaped your operating costs, but you covered what you were paying in rent. The amount of that rent is a function of the productivity of the soil. And that will vary by you know, better soils will have higher levels of rent. 
But what that rent does is it creates value that then gets capitalized, and by an economist speak, it's captured in the land value. The price of the land is, will reflect the rents that are generated. And so you'll generate wealth to the farmer. And then that wealth will argue leads to stewardship incentives. So the idea that the better product productivity the land is, the more wealth they have, so the better stewards of the resource they should be. The idea of taking a longer view, because you want to make sure that if you sell the land, that you're going to, you know, the value of it will be incorporated. Uh, and so it changes the way you think about it. So this is idea of wealth is not necessarily an evil thing to think about when you're dealing with fishery management. So here's this great animation. So what happens if farming was like fishing? Okay, so here we have our tractors all lining up, right? We've got, there they are, they're all on the edge of the properties. We've got the prime farming grounds. And then all of a sudden we're gonna say, okay, the season's gonna open and you're gonna go and you've gotta compete compete to get out to the farmlands, right? And this is what would happen. You'd have a lot of interactions going on amongst all these things, and you'd have essentially the larger vessels or the larger tractors would be the ones that would get the prime land first. And you could imagine if you played this game every year that you'd get larger and larger tractors, right? So, and this is the idea that the farmers here didn't have any rights to the land. They had to compete to get out there as fast as possible. So you'd have the race to farm. So, you know, this is a current tractor, nice John Deere. What would you see if you had potentially the race to farm? <laughs> well, you get very different investments in, in technologies, right? You get essentially overinvestment in technology to outcompete everyone, essentially overcapacity. So farming without insecure access rights, you get excess capacity, you get resource degradation, low-valued products, you get lots of regulations, and perverse innovation in terms of what is the necessary technologies you would need to actually engage in the activity. Zero surplus, zero land value. Sounds a lot like what we talk about our global fisheries. So fisheries today, uh, most fisheries there's no wealth, nor are there any prospects for generating wealth. And the reason is perverse governance systems. So without secure access privileges, the fishermen devote all their competitive and innovation efforts to maximize catch rather than maximizing surplus value. And this drives costs up to revenues and we start to see balance sheets that make no sense. So fixing the problems, addressing the causes. One potential way is individual fishing quotas. There's lots of experience in places like Iceland, New Zealand, now I would say is probably most fisheries. There are, prob I think, up to about 100, 110 different species in New Zealand are under individual fishing quotas. Iceland is probably 25. Experiences in Australia and Canada, US is six, and then there's Gulf of Snapper, Red Fishery, Gulf of Mexico Snapper Fishery. There's talk in the South Atlantic grouper fishery. There's also the Gulf of Alaska, groundfish fishery on the West Coast. There's movements here. For those who don't know, I'll quickly go over an IFQ what it is. It's a cap and trade policy. You probably have heard of SO2 or talked about it in climate change. You're going to set the cap, which is the total allowable catch. You allocate quota, rights to fish. So fishermen know every year how much fish they have. They don't have to compete and go out there to the grounds. They, they know what they, they can catch. And then you can allow trading going on so that if they don't want to fish this year, they can go out uh, and on the market and buy quota from someone else if they wanted to catch more or less. Some of the benefits that we're getting, and these are actually not just proposed benefits, this is, we've got a pretty long experience. I, New Zealand started their system 86, Iceland had versions of an IFQ earlier, really in 1990, so we've got an enormous history now to go back and assess. So this is not proposed benefits, realized benefits. Race to fish is replaced the race to create value. No longer this idea of volume, I want to catch as much as possible, so you get slower fishing. You get fishing occurring throughout the season. So you go, you know, Halibut's a great example in the Pacific Northwest. Alaska, you went from, you know, two 24-hour openings to season lengths of 150 to 200 days, right when they went from the derby fishery, a race to fish, to ITQs. 
you get higher valued end markets. So this idea that you're you know, trying to value added through the whole processing chain, what does that do? Well, you have shifts to more selective gear. And so that's less bycatch discards. Example in a place I know well is New Zealand, where in the snapper fishery, they began selling in the live fish market to Japan, and so they switched from trawl to, to long lines, right? Reduced habitat destruction. You also see agreements coming amongst the, the industry to say we're not going to fish in these areas or we're <coughs> going to try to minimize our habitat destruction. Getting back to this idea of wealth, you also have this idea of generating wealth. And that is, we talked about the value of the land and how important it is under an individual fishing quota. The value of the quota is akin to the value of the land. So you're generating wealth in the system, and that value of the quota is tied to the health of the ecosystem. So you, you generate potential stewardship. So this gets uh, sort of the next dynamics of the wealth creation. Essentially, you have the quotas allocated. They take on values. Once you create this wealth, you get a constituency constituency concerned with sustainability, long view, innovation that increases value, and that goes over things we see, reduced conflicts over TACs, they're beginning to pay for management, cooperative science, they're now working with the uh, biological stock assessments to help improve the science, and a better stewardship ethic. You know, I remember uh, going through documents on the New Zealand fishery where I saw letters from quota owners asking the government to close certain areas, right? They're taking the lead. I also know that occurred in Iceland with some nursery habitat for the cod. Taking the lead and being better stewards. All generates out of the incentives that they have a stake in the resource. Other instruments, um, just sort of, sort of wrapping up, I'll talk a little bit about territorial or use rights. These are essentially you break up a coastline into spatial, explicitly spatial areas, and you can allocate the rights to that to fish to a group, a cooperative, or to a sets of uh, owners. In uh, Chile, and they have the management and ex exploitation areas. Uh, it's mainly done for the loco, the abalone, but it's all, it covers lots of shellfishes within five kilometers of the coastline. Japan has had a system that goes back uh, to the feudal you know, 16th century, where you have fishery management organizations that control the rights in areas to sedentary mobile species, and they work cooperatively with the government in managing the resources within these territorial use rights. You get harvest cooperatives. So these are other instruments that deal with this access problem and insecure property rights. Cooperatives, the Bering Sea Pollock, Pacific Whiting, Baja, Mexico, they do have an abalone and lobster cooperatives. Some of these do better than others. Um, and one thing I do want to mention, it's not an either or. A lot of times you see multiple things being used. So the turfs in Chile and Japan also have cooperatives that operate. You also saw cooperatives form underneath the ITQ system in New Zealand. So quota owners got together to form the Orange Ruffy Quota Owner Management Company, which then you know, worked on improving value, improving advertising, improving the science. So it's not an either or. A lot of these things uh, work together. OK, so I am wrapping up. Um, popular characterization of fishery problems, I think, focuses too much on the symptoms rather than the causes of overfishing and overcapacity. I'm going to argue um, that economic performance should not be a secondary objective that only should be pursued after you reach the primary one of biological sustainability. That in fact by addressing the economic performance of these systems you will address the biological sustainability. You can't just say let's do the, old, the biological and then oh let's worry about the economic performance later which is typically what uh, the perspective that is taken. Then finally, to sort of wrap up, the idea that the generation of wealth is going to create this constituency for maximizing value, not quantity, and that value <coughs> depends on the health of the marine ecosystem. So you get this positive feedback where you develop these sort of stewardship incentives that then address the overcapacity issues, then address overfishing, habitat destruction, et cetera. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. So I do want to thank Jim Wiley again. <laughs>
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd also like to add my thanks to Jim's for this invitation to be here. It's um, quite a daunting thing for an ex-fisherman from Australia to be sitting in Woodrow Wilson House in Washington giving a presentation on <coughs> fisheries, um, fisheries management and overcapacity. But um, we have done our share of, of allowing overcapacity to be created in many of our Australian fisheries and um, I'm hoping that we can some way help to contribute to the discussion and look at ways of, of being able to avoid some of those issues in other fisheries in the future. I'm going to take a, a very different approach to Jim. He, um, he took you 35,000 feet high. I'm going to take you down to the, the bilges of the boat, so to speak. Um, we're going to talk primarily about um, the touch briefly on the overcapacity issues and the causes and effects, summarising some of the, the discussion that Jim raised. I'm also going to touch on case studies involving the Australia's northern prawn fishery and some of the issues that we've had to address with overcapacity in that fishery, and how we've tried to extrapolate um, management approaches from the northern prawn fishery to the Madagascan shrimp fishery, and um, moving towards implementing individual transferable fishing rights in that fishery as a developing country fishery. <coughs> we'll discuss briefly some conclusions from those two case studies. Um, I'll also talk about um, tools that I think are necessary to address and avoid future overcapacity and we'll have a, a brief slide on um, finding the balance between addressing overcapacity um, in highly industrialised fisheries and how that can be transferred to developing country fisheries including small scale fisheries. So just summarising a little bit of what um, Jim says. Uh, causes and effects of overcapacity um, obviously include weak institutional arrangements, um, lack of fishing rights which results in the race to fish, um, market impacts where rights do exist, fishing costs, exchange rates, increased aqu aquaculture production, um, price fluctuations all cause fishermen to um, in input more capital into fisheries to get more production out of it. Um, declining push, fish stocks also um, also causes more overcapitalisation from time to time. As um, and in developing countries, uh, certainly poverty is one of the things that causes both increased fishing pressure and overcapacity in in um, traditional fisheries. Um, some of the effects resulting from those causes are obviously loss of economic rent. Um, overfishing and overfished fisheries, depletion of, depletion of major food sources in developing countries, threats to marine ecosystems, um, loss of fisher and or investor confidence in, in fisheries. When there's too much capital in a fishery, the fishery is not performing well, the investors lose confidence because they're not getting the return that they're expecting for their investment. And finally, um, also in fisheries where there are rights in place, if the, if the rights aren't appropriate for the fishery, you end up with market failure. The first um, fishery I want to talk, talk to you about is the Northern Prawn Fishery, which is a fishery dear to my heart. I started my career in fisheries management as a cook deckhand on the back of one of the 200 boats that was fishing in this fishery in 1980. Um, <coughs> this fishery is Australia's largest largest and most valuable prawn fishery. It runs across an area of approximately 400,000 square miles, however only about 12% of the fishery is actually um, productively fished. The fisheries had long-term individual transferable fishing rights since the mid-80s. The annual production of the fishery ranges from between 3,000 and 6,000 tonne of banana prawns and 2,500 and 4,000 tonnes of, of Tiger and Endeavour prawns, which are our most valuable species um, annually, and management costs are fully recovered from industry in this fishery. <coughs> Currently the, um, the management tool, the primary management tool used in this fishery are uh, individual transferable effort units um, through the form of year units, which are basically constraints on head rope and foot rope. Fishery has 
um, very sound biological, economic and economic and ecological objectives, which are enshrined in a formal management plan. Um, we have clearly defined fishery targets, um, and the fishery target in this fishery is maximum economic yield, which I believe is the first fishery in the world to actually have ec maximum economic yield as its, tar as its target reference point. And the limit reference point is the um, maximum sustainable yield, which in most fisheries is actually the target reference point. Um, we also have very clear cut and well, well articulated precision rules, um, which make life much more simple when decisions have to be made about adjusting fishery effort or capacity. Um, the fishery's got long term fishery catch and data sets, um, both for scientific and economic data ranging over between 25 and 30 years. We have highly sophisticated stock assessment models, including a bioeconomic model, which again I think is um, the first bioeconomic model that's been developed for a, a prawn fishery anywhere in the world. Um, we undertake annual fishery independent surveys, and where we don't have fishery information, we take a risk assessment based approach to other species, including bycatch species. <coughs> Ecosystem management is, uh, very, is very much a foundation of the management of this fishery. Um, the, this fishery developed its first bycatch action plan in 1997, many years before bycatch action plans became popular wisdom in Australia and other places. Compulsory TEDs and BRDs have been in use since 2000. The fishery is accredited by the US for exporting to the US and um, we are currently in the process of uh, a large program to implement marine protected areas. And I'm very pleased to hear that Jim's done some work on the economic benefits of marine protected areas and I'm hoping to have some discussion with him about that after this session. Um, I suppose the biggest, uh, the biggest strength I, I think in this fishery is that there is a very strong co-management system in place. Um, Government, industry, science, NGOs and other stakeholders are all involved in the decision making process right from the management advisory committees up to the board of the Australian Fisheries Management Authority. So decisions are very much a bottom up process rather than a top down process. And I, I think that definitely um, genders for harmony in the fishery <coughs> on most issues. A quick historical snapshot, this fishery commenced in the late 1960s, um, really took off in the 70s. As I mentioned, the key target species are tiger, banana, endeavour and king prawns. There was an open access fishery until limit entry was introduced in 1997. Um, in those days we thought we had fairly strong institutional arrangements, um, government department running this fishery, strong scientific su research support. However, the end result of the, um, the limited entry approach was that indiscriminate issue of licences resulting from very liberal, liberal entry criteria meant 302 vessels were, um, licences were allocated for that fishery in the early 80s. This resulted in an immediate significant overcapacity in the fishery. The first individual transferable fishing rights um, at the time were boat units based on hull and horsepower configurations were allocated in 1985 and I think that would be one of the earliest, um, earliest examples of individual transferable fishing rights in an input control fishery at that time anywhere in the world. Harking back to the comment earlier about the, um, the over capacity resulting from the liberal entry criteria, um, it was very clear that adjustment to target this over, over capacity and to improve fisher, fishery profitability was needed and in fact it was first recommended by economists in 1986 but it was rejected out of hand by industry. No surprise to Jim I'm sure. Um, this fishery has, has had over many, many years had to deal with problems of overcapacity, which um, in turn became exacerbated by effort creep, leading to significant overfishing of tiger prawn stocks both from the mid to late 80s and into the late 90s. 
Um, from an economic point of view, the fishery is very susceptible to external factors, um, e.g. fluctuations in fishing costs, market prices, exchange rates, aquaculture production, etc. And, and that really plays havoc with where the fishery sets in terms of its um, economic returns. Um, as a result, significant and ongoing adjustment has been required to rebuild stocks and improve fishery profitability over time. There have been many adjustment programs implemented in this fishery, some through buybacks, both government and industry funded buybacks, um, some through compulsory acquisition of fishing rights, um, some through um, proportional reductions in the um, amount of gear that's been allowed to be towed in the fishery. Um, over time, these, these have reduced fishing capacity from 302 licenses in 1985 to 52 licenses in 2007. But for many, the pace of adjustment imp was impeded by industry disunity and political intervention along the way. And if you go back to the earlier comment uh, from the economists wanting to um, implement fishery adjustment in 1986, it's, um, it's difficult to think that it's taken us 20 years to get from there to now. Um, one of the things that we have learned in this fishery is that individual trans fishing, transferable fishing rights have provided a very effective mechanism for adjustment, but they are not the sole solution to addressing and avoiding overcapacity problems. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on. I'd just like to switch channels now and take you to a fishery <coughs> in Madagascar. This is primarily an um, industrial fishery but in a developing world context and um, I've been working with the fishermen in Madagascar on this fishery and, and trying to work toward developing and implementing secure access rights in this fishery for the last five years and it's been an in interesting pro process to um, see what, what mechanisms we can take from the developed world and translate into a developing world situation. Um, the industrial and artisanal sector, and I should mention here that um, by artisanal sector in this context we are talking about uh, fishing vessels with, with motors. I know some people refer to artisanal vessels as, as true traditional vessels. This isn't the case in this fishery. The artisanal vessels are almost semi-industrial vessels. Um, <coughs> this sector of the fishery is a major export earner for Madagascar. It yields approximately 10,000 tonnes a year and provides almost 75 million um, US dollars in foreign exchange earnings. It's a major employment source for Madagascar. Um, the bycatch resulting from the trawling activities are an important food source for the locals. Currently 75 art, uh, industrial and 36 artisanal vessels are uh, operating in the fishery restricted to four specific fishing zones. Um, separately, the traditional sector is not managed as part of those currently not managed as part of the um, industrial and artisanal sectors. They, <coughs> the uh, traditional sector is an important food source yielding 10,000 tonnes um, of fish per year for the local communities but using 8,000 traditional pirogues to, um, to get, ob obtain that amount of, of product. Um, and uh, as I said, the, this sector isn't currently integrated into formal management arrangements, but there is some work being done um, on, on zonal committees to try and improve the, to try and get the sector further integrated. Uh, a little bit of a history on the industrial and artisanal uh, sectors of the Madagascan shrimp fishery. The fishery was established in the late 1960s. Um, from 1960s to the 1990s, discretionary and highly irregular licensing policies, lack of transparency in licensing allocation, um, lack of license security, discretionary annual renewal, um, all resulted in uncontrolled fishing capacity and effort a very unstable and uneconomically successful fishery. There was no industry body during those times, no representative body, and there was serious conflict between operators as a result of the way um, the government was handing out licences um, to different parts of the community. The fishery remained open access until limited entry was introduced in 1998. Um, 
during this time the traditional sector wasn't managed um, and increasing fishing effort capacity and, and capacity from that sector negatively impacted on catches in the industrial artisanal sectors. In 1996, the GAPCM was established as the industry representative body um, to negotiate with government on management for the artisanal and industrial sectors. Things looked up in the year 2000 as a result of the work done with the GAPCM and the administration and the government put forward a, a, a decree which limited entry to 75 industrial vessels and 36 artisanal trawlers. It provided a 20-year licence, so some security of access for those operators. It imposed compulsory VMS um, requirement to provide catch and effort and economic data, imposed horsepower restrictions and also gear restrictions. The GAPCM has been very um, proactive in trying to implement appropriate management arrangements in this fishery and, and trying to move the fishery forward and um, following the decree, it, the GAPCM went one step further and decided to increase seasonal closures to protect juvenile stocks and improve shrimp size and values. Um, it increased mesh sizes to, so that small prawns could escape. Um, <coughs> it implemented reductions in head rope restrictions for industrial vessels and also the compulsory use of TEDs and DRDs. Like the northern prawn fishery, this fishery is very susceptible to external factors, increased fishing costs, gas oil prices, market fluctuations, exchange rates and aquaculture production. And like the northern prawn fishery, it wasn't very long um, during the 80s and the 90s before this fishery was also suffering economic hardship and came to the realisation that there were just too many boats chasing too few fish. As a result, GAPCM initiated an external independent review of the fishery in response to declining shrimp, redu shrimp production and declining economic returns. This review was carried out by um, what was known as a mentor <coughs> committee, um, made up of John Goodlad from the Shetland Islands, John Wilson, an economist uh, from Canada, and myself. Uh, we undertook the review of this fishery in 2003. We concluded that the fishery was reasonab reasonably well managed within the context of Madagascar, but that <clears throat> there was a clear need, need for be a better balance, sorry, there was a clear need to better balance effort and sustainability in this fishery. There was a need to improve the economic returns to the fishers and to the nations. There was a need to implement a flexible, responsive management mechanism to facilitate adjustment and restructuring and to improve future biological and economic sustainability of the shrimp resources. And there was a need to formally adopt the precautionary approach to, ma to managing the MSF. We prepared a scoping paper on potential management options which was provided to the GAPCM in September 2003 and an options paper themselves was provided to the GAPCM in April 2004. This was followed by an industry-wide workshop on transferable fishing rights options in July 2005. I'll just give you a little bit of a background onto the review process that we used because what we tried to do was adopt this, a similar process that we've adopted when we've reviewed fisheries in Australia and we wanted to see whether um, we could use this, those processes or similar ones to undertake a comprehensive review and get positive outcomes in a developing world context. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So the um, the cornerstone of of the review was that we would we would look at different types of individual transfishing rights um, and the needs for those for that approach and also investigate the benefits of that approach. Um, we got agreement from the GAPCM and the administration on basic assumptions and criteria for, for assessing the various management options that we looked at. And the options which were considered were boat days, um, sometimes known as time units, uh, effort units, which are a combination of boat days, horsepower and hull size, um, gear units, which are based on foot rope and head rope length, and ITQs, individual transferable quotas. And I must 
asked James how ITQs became IFQs. But uh, because people did not necessarily want to assume that you would have tradeability. Okay. And so you lost the transfer. Right, okay. Well, that's an interesting point because one of the requirements of, of this study was that the rights that came out at the other end of it had to be fully transferable. Um, in looking at the review, the assumptions we made were that, case in point, um, individual, all the individual fishing rights must, that were going to be issued had to be fully tradable. Limited entry would be retained under any new system introduced. The current fishing zone system, which is in place in the, in the fishery, would be retained. Um, closures for biological and ecological purposes would continue, as would the use of TEDs, BRDs and other bycatch programs. The, the new system, whichever it may be, would require ongoing research and data collection and compliance programs. However, we, we recognise that these may vary depending on which system was adopted. And uh, a major point was that we needed to address the complexities of the industrial, artisanal and traditional sectors in allocation of any new, under any new system. We went through quite a bit of criteria to um, uh, and which we would use to determine whether the, the new system, the different options would be useful. I won't go through it all, but it was um, in summary, it had to be, they had the criteria, sorry, the system had to be ex flexible, it had to be equitable, it had to be responsive and capable of adjusting the fishery on either biological and economic grounds in a timely manner. Uh, the rights had to be transferable to allow operators to maximise flexibility um, and trade up and down to suit their own operational or market demands. Um, the system had to be economically efficient, retaining as few inputs as possible to maximise opportunity for economically efficient e exploitation. And given it's Madagascar and uh, third world countries operate quite differently to industrial countries, one of the key things we agreed was that any new system had to be simple and cost effective to manage. It had to be easily understood by industry, um, simple to administer and enforce and above all it had to be legally defensible. <coughs> um, we agreed that in the first instance that the new system would, would be applicable to both the industrial and the artisanal sectors to allow trading between those sectors and adjustment to both those sectors given that they worked so closely together. Um, just how am I going for time here? Starting to. I think it, you're at about 20 minutes. So. Okay. Um, I won't take you through all of, all of these, but <coughs> um, the GAPCM considered the ITQs both days EFIC unit systems. Um, they agreed, obviously, that ITQs do provide more economic benefits than input control systems, and there is flexibility to maximise catch for least cost. Um, however, the complications of, of management in Madagascar, the um, shortcomings of enforcement agencies, the remoteness of the fishery um, made, made it quite difficult um, to ascertain whether this fishery could, t ITQs could be properly monitored and, and managed so that the benefits <coughs> of ITQs wouldn't be dissipated. Um, the conclusion was that probably wouldn't work in a fishery like Madagascar under the current regime. Um, but my personal, my personal point of view was, I think under a different regime it would have been a very interesting fishery to investigate ITQs for. Um, I'll skip through that. Um, <coughs> having, having looked at those other three uh, types of systems, gear units, sorry, I, ITQs, boat units and effort units, um, GAPCM came down in favour of implementing a gear unit system which is similar to the system uh, that's currently in place in the Northern Prawn Fishery. They concluded that head rope is a very good measure of fishing effort, certainly a better measure of fishing effort than horsepower. Uh, it's easily policed, um, which is an important factor in a country like Madagascar. They do have a quite effective surveillance um, program operating there. The, the patrol officers are already familiar with the processes of measuring nets, so they felt that it, was, it wasn't going to be too much hardship to move to this system in that sense. 
Um, under a gear unit system there are opportunities for technical innovation as there are no need to retain horsepower um, restrictions and vessel constraints when your effort's being controlled by the gear. Um, tradable gear units would mean that operators could trade to suit their own operational and market demands. Um, the gear unit system does facilitate trading between industrial and artisanal sectors um, as head rope has the same fishing effort in both of those sectors even though the size of the nets that the sectors are towing are quite different. It was very much recognised that the gear units do provide a flexible tool for adjustment. They give operators the options of buying, selling, leasing gear units, amalgamating, amalgamating licences or fishing with smaller gear when, it, when fishery adjustment uh, has to be undertaken. So the conclusion was very much that um, gear units would be an appropriate management tool for the Madagascan shrimp fishery. The outcome of that review, um, which was completed in the end, I think in September 2006, was that the GAPCM and the administration agreed to adopt gear units for both industrial and artisanal sectors. The total head road allocated to the industrial and artisanal sectors, um, individual gear allocations based on a combination of fixed allocation component and catch history. Future reductions in fishing effort and capacity effort would be implemented through gear unit cuts. Reduction of the need to, sorry, recognition of the need to implement management controls on the traditional um, small scale fishery, sorry. There was recognition of the need to implement management controls on, on the traditional fishery um, and some discussion about whether rights-based uh, systems including individual transferable systems or community-based systems um, could be introduced and that was identified as a pressing need for discussion in the future. Changes are required to the uh, current decree to implement the gear unit system in Madagascar. Uh, this, the, these changes have been agreed on and um, they are in the process of, of implementation. And all things being equal, this new system should be in place in Madagascar for the 2008 fishing season. Just like to do a, a very quick comparison between um, the process, the Northern prawn fishery and the Madagascan fishery. Just to illustrate um, the point that you can, I believe, take Western approaches from industrialised fisheries and adapt them to developing world contexts. Um, we have very different operating environments, um, developing world versus and, and versus um, affluence quite weak institutional arrangements in, in Madagascar compared to highly sophisticated and strong in Australia. The resource sharing requirements are quite different. The NPF doesn't really have any resource sharing issues, whereas here you've, you've got the complexity of the um, small scale fishery, the artisanal and the industrial sectors. The social and the economic drivers are quite different. Um, there is much more focus on the need for the, on, on the Madagascan fishery for employment, food source and the economic return to the nation. And um, conversely in, in the northern prawn fishery, um, the use of bycatch resources is not anywhere near as important in the management process. In fact, we go out of our way not to catch bycatch, whereas in this fishery you're trying to catch it to, to feed the nation. Um, the other side of it is though the, the commonalities, and I found this quite interesting that um, in both fisheries, management's, management is based on the notion of secure fishing access rights, um, autonomous adjustment measures, mechanisms to address overcapacity, shared vision for wealth generation and biological sustainability in, as primary fishery objectives. There's significant invest, investment by industry and others in co-management approaches, and there's considerable potential for increased stock size, improvements in fishery profitability, if appropriate management approaches are in place in both of those fisheries. So the, to the conclusions. <coughs> Having looked at both of those fisheries, I've come to the conclusion that effective management of developing country fisheries is possible, despite generally weak, sometimes not even there, fishery data information, lack of policies, 
lack of laws, lack of good institutions, lack of transparency, lack of public involvement. And approaches used in industrial fisheries can be adapted to the developing world, but one size definitely doesn't fit all. Institutional and management arrangements must be appropriate to the individual circumstance or fishery. And I think that was illustrated through the um, review of options for the Madagascan shrimp fishery, that there were just some options that were so complicated um, that the, a developing country doesn't have the infrastructure to, to properly implement and police and monitor it so that that type of approach would be successful. Um, there, there are no silver bullets for addressing overcapacity or overfishing in my view. There's always going to be a balance needed between fishery objectives. Um, the, the, the balance will, may well be different in an, in an industrialised fishery to the balance um, that you might want to apply in a, in a semi-industrial fishery or in a small scale fishery. You, you heard earlier that one of, the, um, one of the conclusions that we came to in the Northern Prawn fishery experience is that fishing rights in isolation are not a solution to overfishing and overcapacity. A range of tools is required. And we believe that the conventional approaches, including establishment of fishing rights, could and should be adapted for small scale fisheries to avoid further stock depletion, increased poverty, and loss of economic rent in developing world countries. So let's go to the tools that we might have in our toolbox for addressing and avoiding overcapacity. Um, one of the short term ones could be government funded adjustment programs. But I reiterate, that would be a short term, uh, a short term one off approach that might be needed just to give the fishery a bit of a leg up. Jim touched on the need for secure fishing rights in whatever form they come, ITQs, ITEs, community based rights. Um, some might even come in the form of food sharing rights, food sharing arrangements. We definitely need institutional and management arrangements that are appropriate to individual fisheries and circumstances. There is no point in putting a highly sophisticated fishery management approach in an area that has weak institutional arrangements, um, little money and no infrastructure. Regardless of where the fisheries are located, whether they be industrial fisheries, semi-industrial fisheries or small scale traditional fisheries, you should have a defined harvest strategy for that fishery. It can take, it can take the form of, of having um, objectives and reference points or it can be as simple as saying that our fishermen are only going to go and fish three days a week. But you do need a harvest strategy in all of these, in all of these types of fisheries. I think a key element of um, any successful management these days has to be co-management approaches involving key stakeholders with effective engagement with key stakeholders, not just, um, not just tacit, uh, tacit consultation, but effective engagement and, and real buy-on by stakeholders of the approaches that you're trying to implement. Because if you can't get the buy-on from the stakeholders, the best people will, the worst people will bring the best system down. And I think lastly, um, <coughs> for mine, shared vision, respect and cooperation are really the fundamental things that stakeholders have to come to to make fisheries management successful. And I'd just like to leave you with one of my favourite little slides. Um, as you see the, the saying there is, the secret of life is balance and the absence of balance is life's destruction. I think there is, that is um, so relevant in particularly in fisheries management. And the challenge for us here is finding the balance between conventional fisheries management approaches and the needs of small scale developing country fisheries. Thank you. I'll be very brief because we've had a lot of material from two excellent speakers. Um, and I just want to start the uh, process of getting your um, discussion going. So I will step out of it in just a second. I do want to mention, Jeff mentioned that I brought my children, 
who have ducked out of the room apparently, but um, I had earlier today an attended a federal advisory committee on MPAs and my younger daughter, eight-year-old, uh, had some public comments which she generated herself last night and um, her public comment, I'm going to paraphrase it, was um, we don't treat the oceans very well. What is the government going to do about it? And she had some suggestions, first of which was less fishing with large boats. And I thought that was interesting because it was certainly not uh, prompted by me. But the, the role of um, the Woodrow Wilson Center, I think, is to generate dialogue about not what the government is going to do about it so much as what are the donors going to do about these issues of overcapacity and some of the um, solutions that have been raised by the panel. So. Uh, I also sit on a National uh, Research Council committee at the moment in the Ocean Studies Board, Frank Hall is here, on capacity building for ocean and coastal management. And I just mention this because we have been struggling with the questions of fisheries management, coastal management, uh, habitat destruction, you know, basically the whole suite of issues that take place in the ocean and coastal zone. And uh, the central focus of this committee has really been to look for a solution that um, better defines the problem and ad addresses the problem in terms of governance, not in terms of government response, but in terms of governance across governments, across civil society, and across markets or across the private sector. And what you've heard today from both Jim and Annie have been responses that can be generated out of government but also obviously involve these other sectors of what we call more broadly governance. Um, sec uh, developing secure fishing rights is something that can be done certainly by government, but it's something that can be done only w in government partnerships with civil society uh, and with the, with the markets or the industry. Uh, the other thing about governance fully, so involving all kind of three lenses or three aspects of, um, of government, governance in the problem of uh, addressing overcapacity is that it is only by involving those three that you can get management um, arrangements that are appropriate to the circumstances, I think. So, you know, we tend to have a, a situation where uh, often very strong governments go out and kind of preach about the one-size-fits-all solution. And I think the way to kind of de deflect that from happening is to better engage these other sectors um, beyond just government uh, in the development of responses to fisheries. Um, I had a lot of questions uh, that were prompted by both presentations, and I don't want to uh, preclude your questioning uh, the panel, but I just want to set the stage a little bit for a discussion. Uh, one is this question of, uh, we, we could go on, I think, all day long. It would be a very interesting discussion about what actually drives overcapacity and overfishing. Um, it's been my experience that uh, fishers, in general, uh, tend not to be driven by greed at all and that sustainability is uh, a central part of their kind of value system. Um, and I won't go into too many examples of this, but there is an example that I'm familiar with um, in Mexico with the development of a fishing cooperative in Punta Allen. Uh, this is on the Caribbean coast. Uh, this is long before the uh, invention of the term turf, but this is essentially a turf system in which the Punta Allen uh, fishery, or fishing cooperative, had, uh, this is a fishery for a spiny lobster, had basically allocated uh, space to the fishers in the cooperative and had no other restrictions whatsoever. No catch limits, no size limits, uh, nothing. And it's a very interesting system that demonstrates h how quickly fishers are able to um, self-regulate and to essentially get at the, at the goal of sustainability without a lot of complex decision rules. <laughs> Basically, you're allocated one tract of ocean, and if you mess it up, you don't get another chance. And so, and what, what is, um, goes along with this kind of self-regulation or kind of sustainability is also the incredible knowledge that fishers themselves have about not only uh, the species that they harvest, but also, you know, what is 
kind of sustainable in terms of broader ecosystem. Um, so I agree with Jim fully that I, I don't think the, the problem isn't human greed. I think human greed is sometimes a symptom of what is happening when people are not given the chance to basically regulate themselves uh, in a way that is leading to sustainability. Um, specific questions I had about the presentations had to do with um, whether we could say that there are some stocks or species that are particularly suitable uh, for IFQs or ITQs. Uh, what kind of state of knowledge is required? And Annie has just uh, mentioned, based on her Madagascar example, that uh, you don't necessarily have to have full knowledge of the species in order to develop appropriate responses to the overcapacity problem. Uh, but I wonder if, if we can say that across the board, and I wonder if there are, um, uh, there's a kind of a threshold level of knowledge that we need to have in order to institute measures like um, IFQs. Certainly there is a threshold level of knowledge that we need uh, in order to develop um, total allowable catch uh, levels. So, you know, there's a question about what stocks are appropriate for these kinds of tools, what, um, what state of knowledge is necessary for implying, in employing these tools, and whether there are certain social conditions that are kind of a prerequisite for these kinds of systems. Um, and of course, the Australian and Madagascar examples are highly contrasting in terms of the social conditions, but uh, I wonder if there are kind of generic lessons that can be learned from the application of IFQs and other um, tools all around the world. Um, the only reason I was actually invited to come speak here is, because, is not because of fisheries, but actually because I work in marine protected areas and in zoning. And I know that Richard Volk very much wanted me to insert a little statement about zoning and the whether or not there is any link at all between the kinds of things that Jim and Annie were talking about um, and zoning. So I, without going into a presentation on zoning, because I promised to speak very briefly, I just want to say that I think there is a very explicit link between zoning or marine protected areas as a kind of one type of zoning um, and IFQs and other kinds of fisheries management tools. And that, that link is because these zoning measures or spatial management um, measures really help codify or articulate either property rights or use rights. And I think it's, a, it, it's the kind of, these two things can go very much hand in hand. Um, Annie men mentioned that it's, uh, from a fisheries perspective, easy understanding is a kind of important criterion. And that's the other thing that zoning and other spatial management measures do, is they create a lot of easy understanding with people's ability to really focus on what can, they can understand graphically and visually. Um, in terms of what uses are allowable, where or appropriate where. So maybe we can have a discussion about the linkage between zoning um, and uh, IFQs or other measures. Lastly, I just want to throw up, um, in response to some things that I've written on zoning, um, there's been some very uh, heated and uh, almost bordering on histrionic response <laughs> to the idea of zoning uh, zoning large parts of the, what essentially people feel is still commons property. And this perception about property rights as being some potentially unfair, uh, potentially biasing those that are currently uh, in a fishery, for instance, and biasing against or being prejudiced against future entrance into the sy system. So. Um, it, it, these aren't concerns that arise just um, over zoning or just over IFQs. It's the whole question of are we moving away from a kind of egalitarian open access regime in the oceans um, and towards a system in which um, there will be uh, decisions made for uh, use that affect only a few people positively um, and potentially affect many people negatively. Uh, it's also a question has been raised, and I'm not an economist, so maybe Jim can answer it, about wealth distribution. And uh, do IFQs and other kinds of measures uh, create a situation where wealth is only distributed um, to few as opposed to many? 
So I bring those up as possible topics, but I'll uh, let Jeff open the floor, and I don't even have to deal with the question and answer. So thank you very much. Well, we'll still have you on the question. <laughs> I can let you off for that reason. Okay, we have, as I mentioned, colleagues of mine with, with microphones to um, help us engage fully with the, the discussion. Who would like to kick us off for, um, for a discussion, which obviously we have a lot of different areas we could go. There's a lot in those presentations. Uh, who would like to start us off in terms of a question or comment? Huh? The hand in the back. Thank you. My, my name's Rebecca Lent. I'm with NOAA Fisheries. I'll just throw out a wild idea, um, Jim and others. What would you think about internationally created IATQs or LAPS or DAPs? Is that an idea that could happen with maybe a commodity like shrimp or groundfish blocks or groundfish things? Sure. Um, this is coming up, of course, in climate also, this idea of having a unifying climate market. So what you'd have to worry about is um, localized effects, w right? So you have to worry about localized depletion. So if this was a shrimp fishery, to use your example, and you were trading across places, it's possible that the quota couldn't get aggregated in a particular location and decimate the shrimp population, but not, and also any populations that, that are dependent on the shrimp for food. So you'd have to worry about you know, that localized effect, which is very similar in the pollution literature that you talk about hotspot effects. You know, why we don't see these kind of markets for necessarily lead pollution um, is, or mercury is essentially that, the hot spot effect. So you'd have to be careful about how you, uh, you worry about that. Would, would, can I throw it back to the question? Was, do, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to add? It, I assume it wasn't just a rhetorical question. So it, any context from your perspective on this? No, no? okay, so that's fine. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, yes, Ambassador West. Thanks, I'm Mary Beth West. I'm an independent consultant now, but I used to do fisheries at the State Department. And to pick up on Rebecca's question, um, one of the things that, that occurred to me as we started the presentation, and let me say I found this fascinating, and I thank you all very much for a very thought-provoking presentation, but is how this might translate onto, into fisheries on the high seas. And, and a lot of my experience is with tuna, highly migratory species. And um, there, we, if, if we were to try to, to look at some of these property systems, we would ha obviously have to do it in an international context, probably under by international agreement. And uh, that may be one of the kinds of things that, that, that those of us who are looking broadly, globally, at fisheries will have to address it at some point. Can I sure. respond to that? So uh, one of the interesting developments that is going on right now, which is very much kind of in the early stages, is the idea of bycatch trading. And I think bycatch trading in particular for certain species on the high seas makes a lot of sense internationally. So creating one a single market, international market in bycatch. and. Um, that is certainly an issue for a lot of the high seas fisheries, as you know, because of the, the methods used. So um, I think this will have to start small and it will have to start unilaterally within, not just within country, but within a small region, which is what's happening now with um, these discussions on the west coast of the U.S. But I think as it, if it's shown to be successful and engaging, uh, then I think these bycatch markets could develop out in the high seas. Um, with respect to tuna, there's, I mean, right now you've got ICAT in the Atlantic, right? That does set a quota, and then that quota is allocated to the members of ICAT, and they could do with how they want. They could set up their own ITQ system underneath theirs, so that's their sort of countrywide tack. There would be an interesting idea um, to think about opening that up and allowing that some of that to be traded. Right now it's being traded in the back rooms, essentially, at the allocation questions, the countries. But it would be probably a good thing to sort of open that up and allow some trading to go on. You know, whenever you get out to the high seas, and this gets a little bit back to the Madagascar example, a thing like the ITQ, where it's landings-based restriction, you do need very good catch accounting methods and monitoring and enforcement. 
right? And so that would be an issue that you'd always have to deal with um, in any sort of high season, which I think is one of the things that was coming out in the Madagascar example, that they just didn't have that you know, catch accounting systems in place. Um, I, I was going to ask, or at least give um, Annie and Jim a chance to respond to Tundi's point about the zoning and the marine protected areas and how you saw those mechanisms connecting to some of the other the zoning and or the trading and such mechanisms. I actually have to confess I didn't quite understand your point, Annie. Yeah. Sorry, I probably wasn't being clear. So I come into this with the idea that. Um, there's two things that marine protected areas and zoning uh, potentially can offer kind of fisheries management. One is the obvious thing of trying to maintain or boost production as a, another way of kind of increasing the levels of production in order to kind of decrease the problem of overcapacity or having more goods to distribute among the, the investments that are already been made um, in capacity. But the other, and that's that goes without saying, but the other role that potentially ocean zoning and MPAs offer is that they offer a kind of spatial framework in which to um, articulate property rights. In other words, there you can have zones for certain fisheries, you can have zones for trading, uh, for markets, and this is something, uh, you know, as a, you, we're tracking these various donations that are happening around the world at the state level here in California, starting small with MPA networks um, in, in various countries in Europe, in New Zealand, which is, seems to be going full steam ahead, but I, it's very difficult to get information about where that zoning is going. This idea of actually using the zoning not only to do what MPAs do, which is protect sensitive habitat or species, but also to use the zoning as a way to um, uh, develop markets more fully and to um, protect the kind of sustainability of the resource around the fisheries. Is that any clearer? No. <laughs> well, I, it's <laughs> probably because it's a completely different concept to any um, concepts of MPAs and zonings that we've adopted in Australia. Um, we're very much focused on <coughs> the ecological and biological benefits of um, you know, the iconic approach to MPAs, etc., etc. Um, so I certainly haven't put my head to how they, how MPAs would enhance property rights, because the the process in Australia has been they've actually been threat to property rights, um, literally. NGOs have, have come in and said we want to close X amount of these fisheries for these reasons and industry is saying well you can't do that because I've got a fishing property right and if you do that then I want compensation. So this is a whole new um, concept to me. We certainly haven't had that type of debate and I'd be really interested in hearing more about it. I know Jim's going to have a lot to say about this but let me just say that there are a couple of examples um, around the world where they have um, fishing only zones, com commercial fishing only zones, either within a protected area or are more broadly in kind of the territorial sea. Uh, these are zones that are, uh, you could, in Brazil for instance they call them extractive reserves and the idea is not only to better engage the fishing sector in the development of a broad scale spatial management scheme. So there's kind of buy-in <coughs> because you're giving something to the fishers uh, in order to get them better involved in, in coastal and ocean planning. Um, but also as a way to, to uh, kind of recognize the valid use of the ocean for fisheries mm -hmm. and to protect that use against other kinds of uses like tourism and that kind of thing. So these are sm there's a few examples of that, but it, it is one example where that's an ex extreme example of how the zoning can actually benefit a fishery or, or the allocation of use um, for fishing. But Jim, you must have, Jim is an expert on fishing uh, MPAs and zoning, so. I don't know about that. Now, now they're expecting something. <laughs> um, so I, I'll get to a couple points on zoning. I want to echo something Tony <coughs> said. Here you go. Echo something she said about them becoming a catalyst for better securing of access rights. 
And I, there's two things I want to mention. One, the EEZ, EEZ lesson I just put up. Um, what happens when we went from 12 to 200 miles? That was a way of codifying access rates. Uh, but the other is a, an example that I use that I think really try, drives home this idea that it can provide a catalyst. Zoning is typically argued <coughs> as a way of reducing conflicts, right? We zone things on land to reduce conflicts, whether it be industrial uses versus residential gasoline stations in certain places, you know. And the one that everybody's familiar with, the example, and I use this in my class, is smoking, non-smoking in restaurants. That is essentially a form of zoning, right? You are separating out two conflicting uses of that space, the, the smokers versus non-smokers. And there's a lot of focus on just that idea of separation. And I think there's ideas there that you need to think about. What gets sort of ignored about zoning, which is the, where the catalyst comes in, is that not only is the restaurant owner then deciding where to put this non-smoking and sno smoking, they're deciding how large to make, how many tables, how many chairs for smokers, and how many chairs for non-smokers. And in a sense, that is a form of rationalization. right? They're determining how many of what activity they can have. And I, that's where zoning can provide a catalyst to better define access rights. It's in the rationalization part that's associated with the separation, which gets lost a lot. But I think that's, and I do agree with her, I think there's something there. To go back to the EEZ lesson, though, is we can't just expect that when we go to the zoning and we do this separation, we create commercial fishing zones, that everything's going to work great. We have to deal with the insecure rights still. So. You know, I, I argue that we could think of zoning as a very top-down world, like central planned economies, and, or you could think of it incredibly bottom-up, where you just free market world, let it sort of evolve, and there's, using your phrase, it's still up there, there's a balance that's important, and I do think you need to think about how you allocate those rights within zones to try to address some of the incentives that are still there, that you're not dealing with the full access rights, but it is a catalyst to improve um, those situations. So it, it's, and it's a way to build in conservation as a legitimate stakeholder, marine reserves, marine protected areas alongside. Uh, it's also ways to try to anticipate future uses coming down the line for the ocean space, which LNG platforms, aquaculture, etc. I knew we'd get into a discussion of zoning. <laughs> Good. Well, one thing I want to say also about the zoning, I think, which is also maybe lost sometimes, is that some people associate zoning with a fixed or static entity, that you create a plan and then it's put into place in perpetuity. And I think, uh, you know, just like marine protected areas and just like fisheries management, in fact, as a whole, that adaptive management is required. And so as we we will see increasingly sophisticated ways to amend zoning and to, um, you know, change allocations or change property rights as necessary um, as conditions change and as human needs change. So I think this is going to be a fascinating time to be alive and to watch what's happening with, in terms of ocean and coastal management because there are so many tools coming in out of the toolbox and being employed and more and more kind of rationalization, not just in terms of spatial management, but across the board, utilizing all these tools in a very kind of coordinated way. My name is Nancy Diamond, I'm independent consultant. Um, I have a question I'd like to underscore Tundi's point about the equity issues and who are the winners and losers from the ITQs. I mean, many things in fisheries have been touted as the next great thing. And um, this one, to me, seems like it has clear losers. Um, I didn't think about the uh, Asian Peasant Fisheries Associations and how, how do they feel about uh, the ITQs and what you're promoting? And how would they fare? Sure. That, I'm going to let you also address that. But, um, you can design these programs to deal with equity, equity and distributional issues. So Iceland has rules to preserve their social structure. You can restrict who trades with who, like they do in the Alaska halibut fishery. Small boats can trade with small boats, medium, medium. You can deal with that. So there are design rules. When you do that, you reduce some of the gains that you expect from the program. So there's cost to it. But if that's an important goal, you can. So you know, there are ways to deal with the equity issues within the ITQ. So it's still getting better access rights. But I want to come back to one point. What are you comparing it against? The current situation that they're facing is not sustainable. So is it okay to leave them 
in the current situation, right, where they're going to end up overfished, it's going to be com competition with the more industrial sized fleets. Or, so the question is, what's, what's the out there that you can do better? You have to deal with the access. Maybe it's community development quota. Mm -hmm. If you want to allocate, maybe it's like a Chilean. You have inshore turfs, which are used to protect the small scale shellfish fisheries from the industrial fleet. That's really what the motivation of those was. So there are ways to deal with it, but you still always have to come back to the access right problem. How are you going to address that, whether it be small or large scale? Yeah, I guess there's you know, the short and intermediate term externalities that I mean, you would write off as an economist, but you know, other people here who have to deal with development feel and see. You know, so. yeah. We're not all insensitive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Barbara? Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to pick up on that because um, it gets in this very interesting discussion and several of the speakers have mentioned this concept of wealth. Um, we do have to be sensitive to the industrial fishers encroaching upon the near shore fisheries and certainly there are ways, such as in the Philippines elsewhere, where they've said, okay, industrial fishers, you have to stay 15 kilometers out. And even within that territory, what you're seeing is the different fishing cooperatives are trying to set up zones, such limited access areas for themselves. Still, at, at some point, there's just still too many fishers in many of these. And then thinking about how then do you transfer wealth into something that can be used, either for the, the fishers to choose among themselves who wants to stay as a fisher, who wants to get some sort of payment and get out of it. And so I think it's very useful to think about some of these um, transfer quotas or area licenses or even a physical area that then can be used as a collateral or equity for some sort of trading purpose. Um, at some point, um, and I think many of those cooperatives are there now, they just realize that they need to downsize. And so we have to be creative about how can we help them move towards that and making those, those choices for themselves. We have too many fishers in, in poverty. And so no one is benefiting if we do allow that system to continue. I think someone just made that point. Okay. Um, just, so just yeah. sort of follow sure. up on that. Um, there's, in the cooperatives, there's things to think about, such as the pooling arrangements. What type of pooling arrangement do you allow? You know, the idea that maybe if the, the cooperative gets together in this area and says, we're going to pool our catch, we're going to pool the revenue at the end of the year and allocate it as one mechanism to do that, as to try to get at this equity issue so you don't have a race. Um, and you see it's in Japan that they have actually effort management, that the cooperatives will get together and say, you know, we're going to have you fish over here, and then you're going to fish over here, and then they just allocate effort spatially, but the idea that they're going to then pool it um, at the end. The, the flip side of pooling, of course, is the shirking <coughs> incentives, that your, your returns are no longer necessarily directly associated with your effort, and so you can start to see <coughs> shirking. So there's an interesting design issue, how best to design those pooling arrangements. Um, one of the, I think, objectives of this series is for <laughs> folks in the U.S. government who are grappling with this, obviously at AID, but in other agencies and departments as well, um, in terms of kind of going forward, what are the, what are the long-term, but are the short-term actions that may or may not be taken, that may or may not be what you're doing already, you need to do more, stop doing something you're already doing, and such. So are there, there are obviously a lot of ideas that all of you have kind of put um, on the table. Are there either particular priorities or particular opportunities that you really think are there for the offing that would lend themselves particularly to um, uh, kind of a national government and, and this government engaging in ways that be constructive and, and going in directions that you think are positive? So what's your, what's your wish list, so to speak, from the perspective of what you'd like the U.S. government to do? Well, I will offer one thing, which really is not my business to do, but I think uh, one thing that USAID can do in particular is to underwrite the kinds of assessments that are necessary in order to find the appropriate kinds of tools to apply to the problem. So 
uh, we've heard that one size doesn't fit all, and we've heard also the great potential of some of these tools. And um, I think there's a, there is a rational kind of strategy for doing the problem scoping and to, f to find the solution that best fits the problem and the circumstances of the place. So. Um, you know, I'd like to see more of that as opposed to, and I'm not saying that USAID that does this now, but there is a tendency throughout the developed world to kind of come up with these formu formulaic responses to co uh, coastal and marine problems. And I think the kinds of um, studies that have been demonstrated here today are the kinds of things that need to be done more broadly all around the world. <laughs> Um, can I second that? Uh, I just, it, there's the idea of not to bringing capacity and economic performance up with biological sustainability. To realize that those two things are intertwined and it's not one or the other. It's not, don't go into a place and think that a marine reserve is going to solve your fishing problems. It deals with certain things very well and should be used, but it's a tool that needs to be complemented with capacity. You have to deal Wherever you go, you have to deal with these fundamental incentives that insecure access rights provide the users. And so somehow addressing it, however it fits in the current governance or institutional structure, figure out a way that you can best design it. It's never going to be perfect. Um, and you don't always need all the information. Even places like New Zealand, just to get back to something Tundi mentioned earlier, you'd think that you know, these 100 fish stocks, they have biological assessments on those to set TACs. They have biological assessments on about 25. Of course, which ones are they? The most valuable stocks to the fisheries. The other ones, they're just flying by the seat of their pants. They're using the ITQ as a way to collect information that then they could, so but the good thing they have though is catch accounting and they're monitoring that so they can begin to track how catches are changing over time. Um, but so you can, you know, implement things with very little information as long as you have good monitoring uh, and assessment going along with Okay, well, I think we've we've come to about the end of the end of the period. I want to um, thank our panelists in particular for a rich set of experiences uh, that you've shared with us and um, insights to really understand some of the economic tools at both the thirty five thousand feet and and the underwater uh, level. Um, thanks for some good questions from the audience. I will urge you for for kind of summary and, and the video and such from this meeting, but also the whole series, urge you to go to the, the Woodrow Wilson Center's webpage.